Well, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome you to Grand Rounds today. And it's a beautiful Friday, and we are uh, very uh, lucky uh, to have a, a very distinguished Grand Round speaker today, uh, Dr. Charles Locke, <coughs> for our last Grand Rounds of the year. And I think we've learned a couple great things about doing our Grand Rounds in uh, this telemedicine way, in a video way, and we, We've had great attendance, and I think being able to do our Grand Rounds by WebEx is going to be our uh, way moving forward, even when we're able to gather in person. And so this morning, to introduce our Grand Round speaker, who is a hospitalist at Johns Hopkins, is Dr. Ann Sheehy. As all of you know, Ann is our Division of Hospital Medicine Chief, and uh, Dr. Locke is one of her mentors. And so, Dr. Sheehy, uh, please take it away. Thank you, um, Betsy. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Locke as our Grand Round speaker this morning. Um, Dr. Locke received his bachelor's degree from Haverford College in Philadelphia, followed by his medical degree at the University of Pennsylvania. He served his residency at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. He then spent a year as an internist in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, before joining the staff at Johns Hopkins in 1997. He practices inpatient and outpatient uh, medicine, and I will have to call out most recently serving as an intern in the Johns Hopkins COVID ICU in their surge plan as recently as three days ago. Um, he serves many additional roles at Hopkins. Um, he is the medical director for Johns Hopkins International in Lima, Peru. Um, locally in Baltimore, he does extensive teaching. He is firm faculty on the Thayer firm and has done extensive clinic precepting, including serving as my clinic preceptor at Wyman Park Clinic when I was a resident at Johns Hopkins. He's the senior physician advisor at Johns Hopkins Hospital, running their utilization management program and providing expertise in hospital quality metrics, such as length of stay and status determinations based on insurance type. Due to his extensive knowledge and his in this space and strong advocacy work, he was elected president of the American College of Physician Advisors, the National Physician Advisor Utilization Management Organization. During his tenure as president, he has championed the Learning Center to provide online education to physician advisors around the country. He has published peer review manuscripts on the Medicare audits process and observation determinations, as well as many other publications and talks nationally. Finally, Dr. Locke serves as Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Army National Reserves and recently served as team leader in the Urban Augmentation Medical Task Force, FEMA Temporary Hospital, Javits Center, New York City, in April of 2020 to care for the surge of patients with COVID-19 in New York City. And he'll be sharing some of that experience with us today. Most importantly, Dr. Locke has several ties to Madison, including a daughter who just graduated from UW last year. And as I mentioned, he's been a great role model and mentor my entire career, and I'm very grateful uh, for, for that in my life. With that, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Locke presenting Baltimore and the Big Apple, how valid is length of stay as a measure of hospital quality and efficiency. Great. Um, well, thank you very much. And Anne, thank you so much for that, that kind introduction and for the opportunity um, to speak with you this morning. Um, just, I, I have no disclosures other than, as Ann mentioned, my daughter graduated from the University of Wisconsin, um, and I like spotted cow beer and speaky cheese. Um, so, as Ann um, mentioned, um, I'm still a practicing internist, um, both inpatient and outpatient, in addition to my role as a physician advisor at the, uh, at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. And for those of you who are not familiar with the physician advisor role. It's a relatively new position in hospitals over the last 10 to 15 years. And the exact responsibilities vary from hospital to hospital. But basically in, in my role, my job as a physician advisor is to make sure that the hospital resources are being used appropriately um, to help the hospital uh, comply with Medicare rules and regulations under the conditions of participation. And then the third thing is to make sure that, that we get paid appropriately for medical necessary services by third party payers. Um, so with that background, um, I was attending last year on one of the, the firm services, resident attending services, 
Um, and, and I came onto a service and it just seemed to me that a lot of the patients were there and were having complications in their discharge. Um, so I finished my rounding, kind of threw my rounding sheets in a drawer. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, after the dust had settled and I finished all my billing and kind of caught up with other things, I went back and I looked at the patients that, that were on my service on the day that I picked them up. And, and I started the service on a Thursday, so we can't, I couldn't blame weekends or uh, a holiday for some of the things that I was seeing. And I basically, with my physician advisor hat on, I categorized the patients as either having a barrier to discharge, meaning they no longer medically needed to be in the hospital, but there was some barrier to their discharge. They had a complex discharge, meaning they were gonna go to some type of a facility or needed specialized home care, or there was a, what I called a simple discharge, which was the patient medically needed to be in the hospital and the plan was for that patient to go home. The other thing, and, and uh, unfortunately, Baltimore has been particularly hard hit by the opioid epidemic. I also looked at patients who had a substance abuse issues um, that was gonna complicate their discharge and that's in purple. So you can actually sort of see, and, and the exact specifics of, of each line is not important, but you get kind of a flavor of things by just looking at the colors. Um, and, and what I, and then sort of just breaking them down, a, a full 40% of the patients that, that I picked up that day, seven out of the 18, actually didn't require hospitalization on the day that I came on service, but had a barrier to their discharge. Um, and only three out of 18 medically required hospitalization on the day I came on service with plans to discharge home. Um, and the other percentages of, of the uh, other two categories are shown there. So this was rather dramatic. And, and obviously, you know, throughout my course at Hopkins, we're, we're in urban medical center and the medicine resident services um, disproportionately get um, patients who, for whom these issues come up. The, the picture that you get on, on many of the surgery services or cardiology services, a very different picture. But nonetheless, um, this still seemed quite dramatic and, and worse than, than I had noticed in, in the, unfortunately, many years I've been at Hopkins, to, you know, many more that I like to think about. Um, and, and so I talked to the chief residents and, and to see if I could get a sense of this was, you know, just sort of a one-off, I was kind of stumbling onto something that was really an outlier experience, or this was really what was going on in the hospital. And the general sense was that this was definitely a trend. Um, so I, I started um, looking around um, at the data that we have, and, and, and in Maryland, just to be clear, we're, we're not a DRG state, we're, we're a waiver state. And so, uh, through a very complex formula, we're still actually paid on, on a daily basis for hospitalizations. And so we track all this very carefully. And so when hospital days are denied due to lack of medical necessity, they're categorized by utilization management nurses in one of probably three dozen buckets of, as to the reason why. And so what I tried to do was, was group the patients in the buckets of what I call structural delays, which means that there was a placement issue, there was disagreement with the treatment plan with the patient, there was a lack of caregiver at home, lack of community resources, we were awaiting a level of care for under medical assistance, any number of these issues. And then I, I looked at those days by fiscal year, and what I found was both for the Department of Medicine and for the hospital as a whole, there was a trend towards these days increasing. So then to give me a, uh, to give my own, uh, to give myself a sense of, of how big of an issue this was, then the next thing I did in looking in the Department of Medicine, I then looked at delays due to radiology testing and cardiology testing. And this is also something that we track. Um, so, for example, somebody needs a stress test, um, but it's not available that day or an echo, um, and we're waiting for that test. Or uh, a radiology test, one of the, the common uh, roadblocks was a cardiac MRI, which had a limited number of spots. And, and, I, and I looked at those numbers compared to, um, to the numbers I was seeing for structural delays. And if you look here in the bottom in the red, what you see are radiology and cardiology delays. And the other important thing for me to look at this was that we actually put 
special programs in place to try and minimize the number of radiology and cardiology delays, such as identifying patients who were going for a cardiac MRI and whether this was the, the discharge was dependent on the result of this test or expanding um, cardiology testing services on the weekend. And, and what you can see here is over the, from 2015, 2016, we were actually pretty successful in decreasing the number of those cardiology and radiology delays by about 30 to 40%. Um, so that really was a win and a significant um, improvement in hospital efficiency and quality. But unfortunately, when you compare those numbers and these interventions compared to these structural delays, those improvements uh, in radiology and cardiology delays are, are dwarfed by um, the increasing delays in, in, in structural delays for the patients. So then I kind of took a step back and say, gosh, what's going on here? Um, and, and are there any big national or patient population trends that, that could be accounting for this? Um, so one of the things, since this is a big part of my life, is to look at insurance. Um, and one of the things that we see here um, over the last few years is the number of uninsured patients um, has gone down significantly. Now, this data is a little bit delayed, um, but with the Affordable Care Act, the number of uninsured patients definitely dropped. Um, and, and we sort of focused on that as a win. But one of the things that, that comes up increasingly frequently in the hospital on the UM side, often I get involved in, in helping discharge patients, is the patients who have insurance, but the increasing number of people who would are you know, commonly called underinsured, and we're seeing increasing copays and deductibles. And, and at Hopkins, really traditionally, we, we regarded patients as either insured, meaning they had financial ability to pay for all of their care, or uninsured, and we had, we have um, charity programs to address the uninsured. What we don't have are programs to address the uninsured. So you're ready to discharge somebody, they need to go home on anoxaparin, for example, but they have insurance, but their copay for the drug is $200 or $300. And we don't, and patients are not used, used to paying that amount of money, and we don't really have good programs or good ways of discriminating patients who, uh, can't pay versus don't want to pay. Um, and that often delays discharge, or we want to send them to a, a, a particular outpatient service, whether it be rehabilitation or home IV antibiotics, but we find that their, their co-pays and deductibles are a barrier to that discharge, even though the patient is insured. Um, so that's one of the really unexpected and negative consequences that we've seen. Um, and I think we've you know focused a little bit too much well, I don't want to say too much, but we focused on the percentage of uninsured. But again, the insured and the underinsurance issue is really an increasing issue. Um, the other thing is, is looking at age, and this is probably one of the dramatic, most dramatic slides I, I came across in, in, in giving my presentation. Um, and, and you look at the age distribution of the United States. Um, and so I was born in 1963, so right around 1960, um, you can sort of see the, the distribution by age of patients, uh, or patient, of, the, of the population. And, I, and this fits with my own experience. I mean, I remember as a kid, you know, if you met somebody who was 80 years old, that was a really big deal and a rare event. And, and um, on the right, you see 2060, and, and we're about two-thirds of the way there. Um, and, and, and this fits with my own personal experience um, in that it's not remarkable at all now to, to come across somebody who's 90. Um, and so you can see this dramatic shifting in the age of the population. And this is especially important if you're running a hospital um, because we know that, that inpatient spending per capita by age peaks at age 92. So you can see with this aging population, you can see this dramatic shift in, in the, the use of, of hospital resources. And, on, and that's the other thing that's surprising, and I'll just sort of note that, is that you know, we like to think that we've done such a, a, a much better job in having palliative care discussions and, and moving patients when appropriate to hospice, but actually hospice peak spending doesn't peak until age 100. So, um, but I, I just found that very interesting. 
Um, the other thing is sort of structurally, um, and, and these are other things that have gone on. And, and again, this is keeping in mind, I'm looking for things that, that may account for um, challenges in discharging patients. And, and one of the things that, that comes up not infrequently is a patient on the medicine service who requires uh, inpatient psychiatric care following discharge. And we often have trouble um, placing those patients because of a lack of beds. And um, in Maryland, um, we've gone from 3,000 inpatient psychiatric beds to about 960 now. Now, now a lot of this is, is due to change in how we care for patients and a, and a decreasing um, desire to um, institutionalize many patients. But, you know, we, we start, I'm starting to wonder whether the pendulum has swung too far. And, and now we clearly have a lack of, of inpatient psychiatric beds. Um, in, in which there, there's a clear need for them. The other thing, and this is not very glamorous, but I, it, it's un, unfortunately a real issue, is that um, uh, extreme obesity often presents a barrier to discharge and, and being able to care for patients post-hospitalization and finding a place. And, and so there's a lot of focus on, on obesity and obesity trends in terms of general health. But when you're in the hospital, you don't really care about people's 10 or 20 year risk, long term risk of stroke and heart attack um, and diabetes from complications of obesity. The challenging discharges really come up with extreme obesity. And, and you can see here when I was born, you know, back in the 60s, extreme obesity was almost non existent. Um, and now it's a significant percentage of the population, you know, hovering around between five and seven percent. Um, and, and I think we're all seeing this in our practice, and it clearly affects the management of patients in the hospital and, um, as importantly, discharge planning. So that's also another sort of demographic shift over time that we're seeing. The next thing we're seeing is in terms of, uh, of discharging patients is patients with dementia often require um, a, a much more complex and, and often challenging discharge. And in a worst case scenario, if they don't have loved ones who can care for them and or provide 24 hour supervision, um, uh, require trans, um, transfer to facility that can offer that care. And, and you can see here, and again, this is no, no surprise to anybody who's been following this, but you can see that there's been a dramatic, there's been an, a gradual increase uh, in the number of uh, patients in the United States with Alzheimer's dementia. And that's only expected to increase um, rather dramatically over the next few decades. So, uh, you know, these things that we're seeing now, I think um, all of them, the trends are all actually going in the wrong direction. Uh, another patient population is patients uh, that, that often present um, complex and challenging discharge uh, are patients who have end stage renal disease. And again, um, because patients are living longer and our care of these patients is getting better. Um, the prevalence in the United States uh, for patients who carry the diagnosis of end-stage uh, renal disease is, is projected to increase. Um, and this is from a study using different um, uh, parameters about how much this increase is gonna happen. And, and what you can see is that we're probably gonna go uh, somewhere from you know, 680,000 a couple of years ago to anywhere from um, a million to 1.3 million by 2030, which is, you know, only 10 years away. Again, a huge increase in, in patients who are going to present um, special challenges, um, both for care in the hospital and at the time of discharge. The other um, thing that, that, that our experience is, and, and I really I don't want to get political and get into an, an, an immigration issue, um, but but uh, I wanted just to touch briefly on undocumented patients. And, and the reality is, is that when undocumented patients come to our hospital, we take care of them. Um, but the other unfortunate reality is that when it's time for discharge, they do not have access to insurance or other services that patients um, who, are, who are either US citizens or green card holders have. And, and this is, and, and I picked a slide from NPR um, just so that you know, we'd be on the on the low side of estimates of the population if there was any debate, because there's no official statistics. 
But you can see here this, I picked this slide for a couple of reasons. One, that it shows over the last you know, decade and a half, the increase of, of numbers of, of undocumented patients in the, or people in the United States. And also that it's, the, the makeup of this has changed and it's really um, patients from, you know, although predominantly from Central and South America and Mexico, uh, they really come from all countries and, and um, and it's just, uh, again, it, it presents uh, uh, specific challenges um, at the time of discharge uh, for the care of patients. Um, the other thing, and again, this is, um, and I alluded to this in my original slide, is that unfortunately, um, you know, we're all aware that the pandemic before COVID was the opioid pandemic. Um, and, and this is a slide that, that shows you know, the worsening of the opioid epidemic um, by deaths uh, over, over the last decade or so. And you can see that there's been this exponential rise in the last 10 years. Um, but from a, a sort of, you know, I don't wanna say cynical standpoint, but from a utilization management standpoint, if you're running a hospital, you, you really don't care about um, opioid deaths because I mean, obviously, it's a huge public um, health concern, um, but they don't use hospital beds because they, they they passed away. But what you really care about is the impact on, on hospital utilization. Uh, and this is a slide from data from the North Carolina, which suggests that the, the, that what we're seeing in deaths may actually be just the tip of the iceberg uh, in terms of the impact on the healthcare system. Um, and and a certain number of deaths um, can be used as a surrogate to represent um, a certain number of hospitalizations and ED visits. Um, and, and obviously, deaths is just a small proportion of that. And, and as I alluded to, when patients who, um, uh, it's not just the number of patients, but they do um, often require special challenges in discharge, whether it be going to outpatient treatment programs or, or getting them into inpatient treatment programs, um, and, and arranging appropriate follow-up, these can this can be um, a definitely a challenging situation at times. Um, the next thing, and this is a slide that that I often show my um, these next couple of slides, I always share with my case managers and, and social workers. Um, and these two slides will help you be understanding and empathetic to all of your case managers and social workers to give some insight into how challenging their, their job is. So it, it used to be when you were hospitalized, there were, there were only two paths to discharge. You either went home or, or, or you didn't. Um, and now um, this is a slide of, of what, you know, to me that I put together of, of all the different places that I've discharged patients from the hospital. You know, anywhere from a shelter, I've discharged patients back to jail, um, I've, uh, the bottom left-hand corner is a plane. I've actually, you know, been involved in repatriating patients internationally back to their home country. Um, and even if we're sending patients home, it's not just go home, it's go home with IV antibiotics or TPN or wound care or home PTOT, two peds, home peritoneal dialysis or home hemodialysis. So you can see all of these things are, are are coming together to create uh, more and more complex discharges and, and, and helping me understand what I was seeing when I, when I attended on the inpatient service and the, and the sheer number of patients and percentages that were um, in which there was a barrier to discharge or had a complex discharge. So the next thing I, I, I try to do in sort of the utilization management and quality hat is sort of look at these data um, from an analytical view. So, so Hopkins um, participates in something called Vizient, which is a proprietary software that analyzes length of stay for participating medical centers by DRG grouping. And we're in a group, uh, a peer group comprised of uh, 175 academic medical centers. And in fact, your hospital is in the same peer group. Um, one of the interesting things that Vizient does is they have outliers this outlier definition, which I'm going to focus on for the next 10 minutes or so. And, and, and so they take um, all of the hospitalizations from the data that we send them and they group them by uh, DRG. Um, and it doesn't map one-to-one -to, -one to DRG, but for the most part it does. 
And then they make risk adjustment calculations for each patient based on comorbidities and um, some socioeconomic determinants um, to give what they call a risk adjusted length of stay. <laughs> and then the, those um, patients who have a risk adjusted length of stay that top, fall in the top 1% of each estimated, uh, uh, estimated length of stay for each grouping are classified as length of stay outliers. And the length of stay data are all risk adjusted using proprietary formulas. <clears throat> so I'm not able to share the exact formulas that Vizient uses with you. Um, and then it's important to note that each hospital in the peer group can have more or less than 1% of its admissions for a specific PRG grouping classified as an outlier. So it's not that for each hospital, the top 1% are considered outliers. There's, there's a benchmark of, of estimated length of stay at the 99th percentile and any, um, any hospital, any admissions that have a length of stay beyond that are considered an outlier. So at our particular hospital, we actually have 1.8% of our hospitalizations are outliers. Um, and so then what I did was I looked at length of stay total, and then I wanted to look at the length of stay um, with the outliers removed with the hypothesis that the outliers were there for prolonged periods of time not necessarily because of medical issues, but because of some type of a barrier to discharge, uh, whether it be finding a placement in an inpatient psychiatric facility or insurance issues or uh, any, any host of a, a number of what I call these structural delays that I showed you earlier. Um, and so the top slide is our length of stay, um, and this is just Department of Medicine patients, over the last five years for all cases. And you can see that there's a gradual trend towards increasing in length of stay. And what we do is we take the length of stay actual, and then we divide that by the expected length of stay per vision. And if you're exactly at the, at the average for your group, you get assigned a L over, uh, over E of one. And, and our administrators like to use this. And I like to say that they're just, you know, barraged by data all the time. And they particularly like this metric because one is a really easy number to remember and greater than one is bad and less than one is good. And so it's kind of caught on um, in terms of an important metric to look at. Um, and so you can see here that there's been a trend at the hospital um, towards this O over E worsening over the last few years. And that's clearly caught the attention uh, of our administration. Um, but when we take out the outliers, you can see here that we're right around one and, and this uh, over E has been flat for the last few years. Um, and so what that has told me is that we should probably focus more on the outliers when we're looking at, at, at um, length of stay. They're, both patients groups are important because they occupy a hospital bed, um, but if you remove the outliers, it probably gives you a better reflection of, of uh, intra-hospital processes and how efficient you are, as opposed to including the outliers, which are, are really anomalies and, and may have a different set of uh, solutions to reduce their length of stay. Um, the problem with, or, or the issue with outliers at, at the Johns Hopkins Hospital and Department of Medicine um, as I mentioned, is significant and it's getting worse. Um, this is the total number of days um, by outliers in the orange bar graphs. And you can see that we've gone from about 7,000 days up to 11,500 in 2019. Um, and then the blue line is the percentage of day, uh, outlier days of total days. So we've gone from 8% up to 13%. So a full 13% of our total hospital inpatient days are, are, are now accounted for by this 1.8% um, of our, our patient population. Now this is, I will note that these are inpatient days. It does not include outpatient days, which are patients who are outpatient with observation services or following surgery in which we, what we call those extended surgical recovery. So this is not the total of all hospital days. Um, so it makes these numbers look a little bit more dramatic, but, but still quite significant. Um, 
And then this slide, um, if you look at the, the two columns, well, the second and third column, what you can see is the total number of discharges that are outliers and their average observed length of stay. And this shows you that the total, so we're having more outliers. We've gone from 187 to 227. Um, with an, and then they've also, not only do we have more outliers, but the outliers are actually staying longer. And these, we've gone from an average observed length of stay of 38 to um, over 50. So again, and I just highlighted the percentage of outlier days um, here that's been increasing in the or uh, yellow column in the right. The other thing that I wanted to just call your attention to two columns over is the non-outlier days. Um, and you can see there that they've been pretty consistent um, um, in, in the 70,000s. And that's really because the, the total um, number of outlier days you know, is going up, but it's really becoming at the expense of the non-outlier days. Um, because the hospital really for the last five years has been full. We've been running uh, certainly in the Department of Medicine at close to 100% capacity. Um, and so now, the, the, the not, often we look at um, concerns of lack of medical necessities and barriers to discharge um, in terms of payment issues, but if you're full, um, then you're actually starting to run into issues of not being able to care for patients um, because they can't come to your hospital because that outlier patient is occupying a bed. So we have to go in situations where ambulances are diverted and they don't come to our hospital or we can't accept transfers um, from uh, other hospitals who want to send our, their patients to us. Uh, or in some cases you have to delay or even cancel surgeries. So it's really starting to not only financially impact the patient, but, but affect the, the actual fundamental mission of the hospital. So um, the next thing that, that I wanted to just sort of touch on, and, and, I, and, I, um, and it doesn't directly relate to inpatient hospital stay, but it, it kind of gives, I wanted to give a flavor and sort of point to two recent studies to talk about how potentially intractable or challenging this issue is. And, and, and so when you talk about high outliers and high utilizers, uh, whenever I'm talking to people who don't live in this world, but in the medical community, um, or people who are interested in this, uh, who aren't physicians or, or directly in the medical community, uh, I always hear about the, the article in the New Yorker by Atul Gawande and saying we should read it and Com Camden had this problem and they solved it. Um, and so this is a wonderful article, um, and, and I read it when it came out, and, and Atul Gawande is a, is a wonderful author, writer, and, and it was really an intriguing article, and I would encourage you all to read it. And, and there was a lot of fanfare and excitement. It's all been almost 10 years since this came out. But what they found was that in Camden, New Jersey, 1% of patients accounted for a third of the city's medical costs. And what they decided to do was this seemingly simple home intervention of home visits and phone calls and patient advocacy. And what they found was that there was a 40% ED reduction, um, a reduction in ED visits from before joining the program. And so this was really spurred a, a general trend towards these simple home visits uh, and, and phone calls and basically case management as this panacea for this um, seemingly intractable problem. Um, but again, this was an observational study. So just recently this year in the New England Journal of Medicine, there was a randomized control trial where they did basically the same thing in, in, that, that was described in Atul Gawande's article um, from 10 years before. And the primary outcome was hospital readmissions within 180 days after discharge. So what they did was they targeted patients who were in the hospital who had at least one additional hospitalization in the preceding six months. And so what they found was that the readmissions rate between the intervention group and the control group was similar. It was about 62% in terms of readmission rate. The point is that if you were just looking at the intervention group alone, if this were just an observational study, you would see that there was a 38% point decline in admissions and you would say, oh my gosh, our intervention was tremendous. 
it only becomes clear that your intervention really didn't do anything when you had a control group, which um, we didn't have in the original observational study. And, and, and so this graph, I think, sort of illustrates it in sort of a, I couldn't, when I was reading the numbers, I couldn't really wrap my head around um, what they were talking about until they, they laid it out in, in, in the figure. And what you can see here is, is the, and this is the, the quarter let relative to the uh, index admission. So the, the zero is, where it's, which is blank, is where the patients were getting hospitalized. And then retrospectively, you can look at the number of admissions for the patients. And, and so what happens is they only qualify for the study when they get, when they become super users. And then you see this decline. And so what's probably happening and what they probably saw in the paper 11, 10 years ago was simply um, a regression to the mean that was gonna happen anyway, because you were plucking patients at their highest utilization. And so your intervention actually really wasn't doing anything. Um, and this was really quite a, this has been quite a humbling paper. Now, of course, a number of people have jumped on this. Um, including, I, I, I pulled this quote from the internet, Andy Slavitt, who is a former acting administrator at CMS, who personally I think is a really smart guy. Um, and, and he kind of said what probably a lot of us were thinking all along was that you're not gonna cure a lifetime of poverty and hopelessness and racism in, in 180 days. Um, and so these issues that are presenting are, are, are really much more significant. Um, the other thing is that there's been a lot of enthusiasm for case management um, and, and that this is going to um, solve a lot of these issues. And I, and I just wanted to bring up a, couple, uh, this, uh, a pair of papers um, because to me it, 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 it um, highlights a little bit of caution in terms of, again, case management being the, the panacea to a lot of our issues. So a couple of years ago, there was a, a paper that was published that looked at a comprehensive three-month program to help patients and their families who had uh, COPD. Um, it involved um, counseling on self-management, nurse follow-up visits, all the kind of things that we often see in case management programs that, that we are generally under the impression are, are effective. And, and this... Um, this study came, that came out in 2018 and showed that in the intervention group, um, the number of, of COPD-related hospitalizations in emergency department visits was 0 0.72 versus 1.4 in the usual care group. So uh, a, a tremendous difference, essentially uh, less, uh, almost half of the, the number of ED visits and hospitalizations. Um, and, and so this you demonstrated that this program was really uh, effective and, and the authors came up with a number of reasons why they thought this program was so effective uh, and, and they're listed here. Um, anywhere from patient engagement to his or her care, relationship building. Um, so there was only um, one problem with the study is that in the post analysis of the study, they actually flip the data. And in fact, what really happened was in the intervention group, um, the intervention group doubled the number of, of ED visits and hospitalizations. Um, and this, um, and, and there's a, and there's a really good article. I mean, so I'd recommend reading both articles and then there's a discussion of what this happened. And I really give kudos to JAMA and the authors for being completely transparent. And they subsequently, the authors and, and the institution in which it was done have put in additional safeguards to prevent something like this that, that have been happening. But, but it really, to me, um, lends caution to the, the idea that these case management are going to solve some of these issues. And, and they talked about having further research is needed to determine reasons for this unanticipated finding. Um, now, if I'm just going to editorialize for a moment as, a, as, a, um, as an internist who practiced both inpatient and outpatient medicine and was really doing it full time for 10 or 12 years, um, the, and I, I've talked to some of my colleagues in similar situations, and the, the finding for us was not so uh, unanticipated because what happens is these patients, you know, imagine they're, they're at home and, and a nurse... Uh, 
care manager calls them and asks how they're doing, and, and they say that they're more short of breath, um, which is probably going to be a lot of the patients who've been hospitalized with chronic COPD. So that usually precipitates a phone call to their physician, who's usually a primary care internist or family practice doc, who's in the middle of clinic trying to see, you know, 20 to 30 patients. And, and so the, the physician, again, this is just editorializing and hypothesize, gets a phone call that their patient is more short of breath. And so obviously that's concerning. And, and so the, the internist or family practice doctor can stop what they're doing and become late in clinic and, and dig up the chart and go through everything and spend 20 or 30 minutes on the phone trying to sort this out. Or they can tell the patient to, after a brief conversation, come in at the end of the day. Um, and then they're gonna you know, stay late and the staff is gonna stay late um, and their family's not gonna be happy because they're gonna be late for dinner once again. Or the third option is just to tell the patient to go to the uh, nearest emergency department. Um, and there they're seen. And then, you know, as we all know, once patients get to the emergency department, especially with this kind of a medical history, um, there's not a, a small chance that they'll then be hospitalized for further evaluation. Um, so that's my personal hypothesis as, as to what might explain the findings that they saw. Um, so in, in, in sort of conclusions and discussion points, um, what I wanted to suggest is that his length of stay at our hospital, certainly at Johns Hopkins, is it being driven by forces outside of hospitals' direct control? Um, are, are we pretty good at our processes, but are there so many patients that require services beyond the hospital or, or have social or economic situations that are complicating their discharge? Should we focus now on extra hospital resources rather than social determinants of health as an adjustment for payments? And I have to say that people um, at CMS and other places are, are, are thinking about all of these things. It's not that, that I'm coming up with anything revolutionary. Um, and then uh, should we look less to intra-hospital resources and, and um, more towards extra hospital resources to reduce length of stay? Would, for example, we be better working with the state of Maryland to increase the number of inpatient psychiatric beds than adding more case managers uh, uh, to our hospital staff? And then just um, because Ann asked me sort of to touch base about my recent experience um, in New York, um, and I kind of wanted to tie this together with um, uh, the recent COVID epidemic. Um, is when you reach the hospital's capacity, the impact on, on increased length of stay on payment um, becomes secondary to the impact on the ability to provide patient care. So when our ED is full and there's 15 patients in the hospital or, or in the hallways waiting to get hospitalized or we can't accept patients who, from community hospitals who need the care at our specialized medical center, I don't care about whether we're getting paid for a hospitalization. Um, I just care that if the patient, if there's a patient that doesn't need to be in the hospital, we need to get that patient out to, to make way for another patient who needs the care of our acute care hospital. Um, so we've been kind of bumping up against this hospital capacity issue for the last few years. Um, but if there's anything um, that, that came out of what happened in New York City, we kind of saw what happens in, in truly a catastrophic situation where you completely overwhelm the ability of, of uh, the healthcare system to care for patients. Um, and so this is just a few slides I'm gonna share with you about my experiences um, in New York City. So as Ann mentioned, I'm in the, um, the Army Reserves as a, as a doctor, um, and I really never expected anything like this to happen, but um, you know, given the situation in New York, the Department of Defense was called upon to assist the, the local healthcare system, and the operation was actually called Operation Gotham. And to give you kind of a sense of what was actually going on in New York City at the time, so we got up there the first week of April, right in the height. So New York City, which has a population of about 8 million, were getting they were exceeding 1,500 hospitalizations a day due to COVID. If I compare that to Maryland, and Maryland in our hospital has, has converted entire floors over to COVID care, uh, and Maryland is considered a hotspot. 
Um, you can see here that at the worst, we were running between 150 and 200 hospitalizations a day with a population that's only a, a little bit less than New York City. So they, you know, New York City has, you know, 1.2, 1.3 times the population that we do, but they, in, in, from the state of Maryland, but they were having eight to 10 times the number of admissions daily for COVID that we were seeing. So it was truly uh, a, a catastrophic situation. And then in preparation, I kind of pulled Wisconsin data. Now on your Department of Health site, they don't list daily hospitalization data or I couldn't find it. But I did find that since for the entirety of the pandemic in the entirety of Wisconsin, um, you guys have had about 3,300 hospitalizations for COVID. So basically New York City in a little over two days um, has had the total number of COVID patients uh, that you guys have had uh, in the entire state for the duration of the epidemic. Um, the other thing, just to kind of give some perspective to myself is this is, so I trained, I went to medical school and residency in the late eighties and early nineties. And, and this is this is actually my second um, viral pandemic. And, and the impact of AIDS, for those of you who are old enough to remember back in the late eighties, early nineties was huge. I mean, it really was a societal changing event. But if you look here, the total number of deaths in New York City, which is really an epicenter for AIDS, was only 8,000 patients per year. Um, and, and so during the AIDS epidemic, which again was, was a huge uh, life-changing thing for, for the medical community, we were never worried about overwhelming the healthcare system. So, but that's what was happening in New York City. And, uh, you know, for those of you who are following in the news, um, you know, these reports started coming out from the community hospitals that, you know, things, the equipment is running out faster. I've never seen anything like it. They literally did not have enough bed space. We were worried about running out of ventilators. These were all the things that were happening. So in response, um, the Department of Defense um, sent people to staff a FEMA field hospital in the Javits Center, which is where I was. Um, the, they sent the US Comfort, USS Comfort uh, to take care of patients and they deployed um, personnel um, to the hardest hit community hospitals in Queens, Brooklyn and the Bronx. Um, this is just me. I put in just one sort of a vacation slide, you know, I'm at Fort Dix where we staged for a day and did some briefings before we went to New York City. Um, this is the Javits Entrance Hall, um, which then got be con converted to a medical center. And then this is the part where I worked, which was the non-ICU. Um, so this entire conference space was negative pressure um, and patients were given a cubicle. Um, and this is what it looked like. And the, the rooms really did look like that, except generally once the, there there was also a patient and almost all had an oxygen generator there. So they were really, uh, they were, the way it was set up was that they were originally, it was supposed to take care of non COVID patients and that quickly, the mission quickly changed to take care of just COVID patients. And what we were doing was accepting patients who were relatively stable from outside hospitals as follow up. Uh, or, or for continued care. And most of these patients were single organ failure, respiratory, who required oxygen um, during the convalescence uh, state of their disease, or increasingly as things got really bad, we were taking patients who we thought weren't gonna require intubation and taking them directly from the emergency department or after a very brief hospitalization. Um, the, a certain percentage of these patients um, ended up declining and going in the wrong direction and required either high flow oxygen, CPAP or mechanical ventilation. So there was an ICU side. So they could be intubated and maintained on a mechanical ventilator. Um, if it looked like the patients were gonna be mechanically ventilated for a prolonged period of time, they were transferred back to a uh, descending hospital or another hospital, uh, but there was ICU capability. Um, and this is rounds in the ICU. Um, and then this is our admitting department. And you can see here a patient arriving by stretcher on the left with the admitting staff on the right, doing all the paperwork, um, getting the patients in. And then the other thing I wanted to give to a shout out was that there were civilian doctors um, who volunteered, uh, received no payment to come work with us. And this is a cardiologist from Queens who was uh, on, on my team. 
Um, so that was really a humbling uh, experience um, and, and really made me feel good to work with these doctors who, who were giving of their time um, and taking care of sick patients at not insignificant personal risk uh, without compensation. And then the hardest part for me was two things, and I included this slide, was wearing the PPP, PPE um, all day. That got really uncomfortable after a while. And then um, I had to use a touchpad, which I hate anyway, to put in the sign out. And this is me pathetically trying to enter in data, wearing gloves and, and, and putting data in with a touchpad. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to say, this is one night I went outside. This is actually Times Square. Um, and, and New York City was a very strange place. It, it was really deserted. Um, and, and this is Times Square without any people, which is something that I, I really had never seen before. Um, so I think I'll stop there. Um, and then um, I hope, um, you know, I'm actually available to answer any questions. All right, I am just unmuting. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Locke. That was fantastic. And I am a general internist, and so I uh, really appreciated your perspective as a, a, a primary care physician and hospitalist. When I heard you talk, uh, I will start with the first question. It did resonate that, of course, we're never going to change someone's life in 180 days, uh, and that this is really one of the that systemic racism, uh, food deserts, and other things are really what we need to address. Are you hopeful that um, with the pandemic, with uh, George uh, Floyd's murder and others, that we might truly be able to address systemic racism and other things that are, that are uh, impacting people's health? Um, I, I'm hopeful. Um, let's just say I'm hopeful. Um, I, I, I'm hopeful that this will, um, that this pandemic may sort of lay bare the, um, some of the issues that we've all been facing um, as physicians that we've all seen um, and, and make them blatantly obvious to, to everyone and, and hopefully encourage us to uh, address them. I am too, thank you. A question from the audience. Uh, you mentioned a number of patient groups that end up contributing to the extended length of stay. Which of these groups should we focus on? And is there one or another that you think might make the biggest difference? Um, so we don't have the data to, um, to really dig down to that level of granularity, um, but but to me, there's a few things that are that are um, what, what I call low lying, you know, low hanging fruit. And, and one of the patient population group is the patients who are waiting discharge because of a guardianship issue, and that has to go through the court system here in Baltimore, which can take weeks and in some cases months. Um, these patients are medically stable to be cared for at, for example, a skilled nursing facility or an assisted living facility. And and um, and what I would like is to change the state rules and regulations so that these patients can be transferred out of an acute care hospital um, and be cared for there while this administrative process goes on. Um, I, I really want to, and the problem is, is that we're not used to doing that. I mean, that's that's what I mean by an extra hospital process. I mean, we're pretty good at doctors and, and, and uh, case managers at, at looking at problems within our hospital and fixing these things. Um, but fixing things that, uh, such as the guardianship issue, is extra hospital and requires politicians and elected officials, and that can be more challenging. But I'm hopeful, again, getting back to the pandemic, is that you know, these, these issues of this patient, it's, it's not simply an annoyance for the hospital. Keeping these patients in the hospital is gonna impact the abilities, the hospital's ability to serve the community. And, um, and so people who need the hospital are not gonna be able to access that. So those are the kind of things that I would look to focus on, sort of major issues um, in, in patients which are remaining hospitalized for weeks and weeks but even if it's a small number of people. Thank you. 
Uh, another question. What about multiple comorbidities and other risk factors impacting on length of stay at your institution? Are there any statistical multivariant analyses? Um, yeah, so the, so the way the Visient data looks, when we look at the observed over expected, that's all risk adjusted. Um, and so all of that is taken into account. So when we see people exceed their expected length of stay, then that's already taking into account their multiple comorbidities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the audience? I'm just going to leave uh, this. Yes. Um, this is from one of our uh, geriatricians. Let me just move to the chat box just a second here. Um, it says, thanks for this important breakdown on, on complex factors that affect length of stay. Agree with the evidence base for interventions focused on high utilizers is limited. What do you think of the evidence based on the geriatric care models um, that have uh, RTCs from um, Hopkins Health researchers, e.g. the hospital at home? What are the barriers or facilitate, facilitations to implement complex care models for complex problems in practice in a home environment? Um, so that's a really good question. And, and um, what I, and there have definitely been studies that show that these interventions can um, reduce uh, length of stay or, or hospital utilization. Um, and, but what I wanted to focus on, on just the two articles that I showed was that it, it's a bit of a mixed picture. Um, and so there are definitely interventions through randomized control trial that have been shown to be effective. Um, but on the other hand, there are some things that where we may not be as effective uh, as we think we are. And any barriers for facilitators to implementing complex care models for complex problems in practice? Any anything you're aware of? Um, well, one of the things that that we've implemented here at Johns Hopkins is we have a once a week what we call a barriers to discharge rounds, where these highest level cases. The, the most intractable cases are, are, are brought to um, social work, case management leadership, and uh, one of the physician advisors. Um, and often these, uh, and there's a discussion because sometimes the hospitals, um, we, we can solve these issues through a multidisciplinary approach, or sometimes we can solve the issue with a letter of agreement in which the hospital will agree to bear some cost of some service. Um, and so there's opportunities to do that in a formal way um, and on a regular way rather than on an ad hoc basis and you know chasing people down and sending emails. Um, and, and that's something that has, has been effective um, to some extent. Well, with that, uh, thank you very much. This has been very informative uh, and sobering, of course. And so we look forward to Hoping to find some solutions for this over time. And thank you very much for joining us from Johns Hopkins. Take care. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for having me.